slowly after we've identified every dystopia we can see. And that's okay. That's natural. That keeps us alive. But it means we have a bias against what's called intelligent optimism. Heard that expression before? Because all the data show the world's getting better and better and better. But you know what? We're going to go to the dystopia first because, man, it feels good. Kind of emotionally satisfying. And it's been adaptive for a long time. It was a very dangerous world until very recently. Where are we? So we're here. I love that. Stole this from Wait But Why. Any people know Wait But Why? A lovely blog. Unbelievably awesome. You know, we think things are just going to keep going like this, but no, we're actually at the knee of the curve, and things are just going to go vertical very soon because of this deep learning stuff we're going to talk about. So there's Moore's Law. Everyone should know that. Every two years, computers twice as powerful and almost twice as um, miniaturized. But Kumi's Law is another really valuable one you should know, and that's every two years, computing per uh, computation uses half as much energy. Do you know that? That means the environmental footprint of these machines <coughs> exponentially shrinks, unlike humans. Every new generation of humans uses as much resources of the natural world as the previous one. What about machines? No, they're doing that nanotech infotech thing that I told you about. And as they dive into the nanotech space, they just use less and less physical stuff to do more and more. But Mr. Fuller, that amazing futurist of the 1930s to 60s, called it ephemeralization, doing, think of ethereal or something like that, or diaphanous, it means, you know, using less and less, ethereal, using less and less to do more and more, and eventually you're doing almost everything but almost nothing, and that's quantum. So this world's not going to slow down, so the physical world, things are getting faster, smaller, and cheaper, and the virtual world, things are getting smarter, stabler, and better. Why? Because if you virtualize something, you can run a bunch of sims in your head before you actually do the thing. You can see all the bad branches of the tree that you don't want to go down. When your simulation gets good enough, you actually prevent yourself from going down a bad branch because you, you do what's called pre -vising. You pre-visualize it in your head. And that's why whenever you add simulation to any complex system, whether it's a human or a computer, it just gets smarter, stabler, and better. It's better able to defend itself and find the right forks of the, of the tree that keep pushing it towards the things that the collective things that it that it preferred. So you know, there's your nanotech, the physical infotech. You know, the five megabyte uh, device they are loading on the plane in 1956, and there's your 200 gigabyte device. And infotech does the same thing. What you see there is something called dematerialization. What's that word mean? It means substituting physical things with informational things, with software, with models, with thinking. So your iPhone has dematerialized all those products because it's so far into virtual space now that it can simulate them without needing the physical hardware. Interesting, huh? So you get this miniaturization and this dematerialization that both continue, and that's why this acceleration, it's reasonable to say it's not going to slow down. So, of the 10 areas of technology change we cover in the guide, two of them are weird, two of them are unique. The blue one is the kind of engine of acceleration, that's that nanotech thing, and that green one is kind of the steering or the brain, the visualization, the virtual space. And so, technology gets more brain-like, and it also gets more, um, dense and miniaturized and efficient on, it, on its uh, nanoscale. Oh, and then those accelerations drive all the accelerations we see in the other areas. Which is why you really want to understand, as Archimedes said, give me a lever that moves the, and I'll move the world. We want to understand those two levers. We want to think about how to humanize our uses of both infotech and nanotech and how to use them more intelligently to get all the good things we want in the other area. Now here's another J-curve. This is a J-curve of income, of GDP per capita over a thousand years in Western Europe. Anyone want to tell me where the knee of the curve is? What happened? The knee of the curve. Yeah, yeah. We, we replaced this stuff with internal combustion engines. It's just so much more dense. It went into inner space. It was so much more 
uh, um, energetically dense as a way of, of creating um, force, power, than this. It's, it's two orders of magnitude more dense than the muscles of a horse. We all know one horsepower in a car, and we have hundreds of horsepowers in our internal combustion engines. In a single step, somebody, somebody uh, perfects the new common steam engine, and suddenly we have 10 orders of magnitude more power than a horse. And then we went up another order of magnitude, fiddling with it a little bit more. Earth Plenty is a fantastic book that describes that J curve and why it occurred. The four, he has a four factor model for what caused the exponentiation of personal wealth. Now, when personal wealth emerges because of technology, the rich poor divides go up or down at first. Up. They go way up. As Thomas Piketty says in the, his new book, it's just too easy to, for people, owners of capital, to use technology to create more wealth at the top. And then only later do we socially make the decision to redistribute some of that wealth because we decide that too much inequity in wealth or power distribution actually hurts democracy. The people at the top can capture the democracy and rearrange all the chairs and have all the laws work for them. We know, we know. And so over the history of humanity, you see rich poor divides going like this. Exploding and then closing, exploding and then closing. When was the last great closing of the rich poor divide in the United States of America? What were the major things that happened socially? I'll tell you when the last great expansion was. It was called the Gilded Age. Mark Twain wrote about it. Uh, J.P. Morgan bailed out the U.S. government. That's how much money that the tycoons had in the 1890s to the 1910s. Still, this is actually 1890s to 1910s. And what happened in 1914? What did we invent? Actually, what did we invent in 1910 for Sherman Antitrust Act? We're going to break up companies if they get too big. And people like Teddy Roosevelt, they did it. They actually broke these companies up, and they actually kept them broke. And then in 1914, we invented the personal income tax. People don't realize how late in the 20th century we invented that. You make more money, we take more money. 1950 was the highest marginal tax rate. That was the maximum of the closing. In 1950, under Eisenhower, a Republican, if you made $3 million of personal income, you didn't shelter that in a corporation, from that point forward, every additional dollar after $3 million, how much did the government take to give back to the people? 90%. It was over 90%. <laughs> but you either made a corporation or you gave back 90 cents on the dollar. And Sweden was that way until very recently, 70 cents on the dollar over something like 2 million. But once there's so much wealth at the top, they finally start changing those rules. And from the 50s to today, have the rich poor divides been growing or decreasing? They've been growing. And many people say, well, look at history. They look like this. The greatest divide, the greatest divide ever was the feudal, was the era of feudalism, okay? where people were actually kept into their social place and they had no possibility. They were they were serfs. They were indentured. Almost everybody was indentured, right? So we've been breaking that. <laughs> we try and close it, but then technology, new technology comes in. Why did that great divide happen? What happened in the 60s that caused this incredible divide of wealth? Incredible creation of more wealth on this curve. More climbing the vertical. What happened then? Yes! Globalization and uh, the telecommunications revolution. So you can finally start moving factories everywhere. We all know the effects of globalization and automation, right? Green Obama revolution. talked about the recent Green revolution. Revolution. Globalization and automa automation, two major disruptors that increase the divide, and then you have to do something to close it. So these are natural processes. Yes? I mean, I, <clears throat> me or? Yeah. Well, uh, I think from a financial perspective, also just generally global explosion of debt and debt as a phenomenon in itself, debt being created, more debt, debt being traded on Wall Street, basically driving people into these financial hamster wheels. Yeah, you're right. bringing up the whole, uh, the whole, there's two special industries I talk about in the Foresight Guide. They're unique to all the others. That's finance, well, you could say the military industrial complex, remember Eisenhower? But it's actually the military industrial financial health complex. All four of those are actually special. And the two that are the lowest level are actually finance and healthcare. Healthcare has gotten, it's basically enriching a small group of people who own the whole network, and it's all structured to just 
take massive amounts of money from people. And it's just going to continue doing more because the stuff's actually starting to work now. Actually, it didn't work in the 50s. It actually starts to work. So we're, we're willing to pay for it because it, it's actually starting to work. But uh, let's, let's move on. <laughs> so the billion dollar tech startup was uh, the stuff of myth until 10 years ago, and now we have these unicorns, right? These companies, the unicorn is a company that went from startup to 5, 10, or 15 billion dollars in under 10 years. We have the first decacorns with Uber and Airbnb, over 10 billion dollars in <laughs> under 10 years. How is that possible? It's possible because of three things, openness, tools, and scale. Let me finish the slide and then we'll jump. Uh, like Andreessen said, software is eating the world. There's crazy openness, crazy numbers of tools, and crazy scale for any hardware or software product that you put up on your connected world uh, web today, right? And crowds are driving change. We have crowds for everything. Start Engine is now an equity crowdfunding company. You guys know what equity crowdfunding is? Yes. As of two months ago, uh, two maybe two and a half months ago, every single one of us can can for a minimum of four hundred dollars become a venture capitalist. Get a piece of the company. It's no longer just getting, you know, whatever product they're creating on Kickstarter. Now we get a piece of the company if we go to Start Engine. And there's zillions of companies that, uh, that are launching uh, 10 to 30 million dollar um, rounds now on Start Engine. Now only two and a half months in. It's a very interesting world where we're empowering from the bottom up, and it's just getting started. There's 400,000 Kagglers who will solve a data science problem for you on Kaggle. There's uh, 350,000 technical solvers on Gerson Lehman Group who will take a crack at any product, any, any technology problem you have and try and solve it for you on the cheap. And if you have 10,000 or more, you can put up an actual contest on incentive and get access to 400,000 people who are even more uh, technical than the folks on Gerson Lehman Group. And these things are still in their infancy. This space is going to incredibly explode, and it's very exciting. So, one of our favorite programs, right? Like Littlefinger and Bear said, you know, chaos. We're in a world of incredible digital disruption, and chaos can be a pit, as Vera says, or what did Littlefinger said chaos can be? In the wall, first series, first season, Wall, the best of the first season episodes. Chaos is not just a pit, Lord Varys. Chaos can be a ladder. I can rough it from the destruction from the, the people around me, and I can climb my way into my, you know, to a better position. And that's the world we're in. It's an amazing world. So where are we going? Here's here's the the. Um, the C1, this is a self-balancing motorcycle that they have prototyped up here in San Francisco. You may have seen a few prototypes driving around. This thing can lane split, but it has two gyroscopes in it. So at a stop sign, it sits up perfectly upright like a weeble. Wow. Yeah, completely fully enclosed. Internal airbags, they're going to add external airbags that are sonar deployed because they think they can make it safer than a Cooper Mini if they have the externals on. And yet I can go A to B twice as fast as any car in any uh, rush hour traffic, because I'm lane splitting all the way. Here we go to uh, Buenos Aires, there's thousands of motorcycles on the street. They have a special in inside lane on their freeways now. They're just crowding out the cars. This could be the future of cars. It's, is this more dematerialized than an ordinary car? Does it have more infotech and less matter? See how everything kind of has bits of those, of the, of those futures in it. This may be the main thing that billions of people in the, in the emerging nations buy as their family car or, or rent if they're Uberizing. Right? It's even more dematerialized. Why do I have to actually buy the thing? Let me just rent it on demand, talk to Siri, and have it show up magically at the curb, right? So, we had the web. Then we had the social web, which we're in right now. My argument in my Medium series is five years from now, the Asian web starts. What's that? That's a world where in 2030, you're reaching for a can of tuna, and you have your wearable, you know, you, you had your Google Watch or your, you know, the Android Wear comes out later this year. Have you heard there's two of them? GPS and heart rate, and Google Assistant baked into the, that's going to be an awesome smartwatch, because Google Assistant's smarter than Siri. I, I don't mean to offend if you're Apple. I love Apple too, but it's smart. Imagine now 
when you're reaching for a can of tuna in 2030. This gauge is way smarter now than they were. The thing, you know, it sees you reaching for bumblebee, and it knows you care about mercury levels, you care about killing <coughs> dolphins. You know the chicken of the sea is killing less dolphins. It was actually reported in your favorite magazines just last month. So you get a little green arrow on the back of your AR, you know, wearable backing hand, you know, AR bracelet watch, or your little head-mounted AR, you know, magic leap display, or maybe just whispers into your ear. Whatever it is, some natural interface that's almost invisible. You move your hand two inches to chicken, to chicken of the sea, and your agent sends an automatic boycott message to Bumblebee. We're still still killing the dolphins, or if you're, you know. If you're filling up your car, you route yourself to the to the big corporate, you know, um, fossil fuel company that's doing the least greenwashing this year. You know, it's the it's the most authentic of all the inauthentic greenwashing that all the big guys are doing. And how do you know this one's the best? Because all of your friends are rating all this stuff, all those Amazon ratings, and the and the Netflix, and you go to you go to. Um, uh, IMDB, you don't watch anything less than 6.8 unless it's sci-fi, you'll go a little bit lower for that because you like it, right? It's like, you know now! But you know what? You know at least 20% of those ratings are shills that somebody paid for. Wait until you can actually de-shill it and have the knowledge web, have your agent just show you the ratings of all of your trusted friends in there. No sock puppets. Imagine how much more valuable those ratings are going to be. That's the world that we're going to. How do we know we're going to that world? Um, because um, Google now fact checks, fact checks websites. PageRank is now called RankBrain because it's a neural net, it's an AI, it's a brain-like system. Remember the anti-vaxxer websites? Remember those anti-vaxxers? Don't vaccine, you get autism. <laughs> Google decided. Yeah, Google decided. Google Google spiders all these websites. If there's more than three, if there's three or more factual inaccuracies on the website, what kind of what do they do to its rent? They push it into the crap zone. It just all those anti-vaxxer websites just disappear now when you're googling vaccines. Remember Lycos? How many people remember those? How many remember Lycos or? Or what was the other one? Oh, Alta, Alta, Vista. Alta Vista. Before we had PageRank, remember how crappy a search was? And then PageRank comes out and it's just, oh man, the searches are so much more smart now. The top 10 page. Well, with basically this knowledge graph that emerged in 2012, this knowledge graph, that little bit of information you see now to the right whenever you Google any particular thing, that's going to get smarter and smarter. It's going to be truthfulness, it's going to be uh, relevancy. It's going to be values-based relative to the values you care about. You're going to be sorting on all those kinds of things. Well, let's get to that. Where is your value system? So we'll get to that. We'll get to that too. We'll get to that too. But first, I should mention there's an agent nomenclature. So an agent that has a lot of autonomy, it'll work on its own, but it's not smart as a bot. An agent that has a lot of intelligence, so it's got a self-model. I'm sorry, a, a world model is, is smart. An agent that's highly personalized, it knows your values, it's spidered all of your email, it's listening into your conversation, it's watching what you're doing, that's a sim. Because it's a personal simulation of you. Even if the thing doesn't look like a sim, it looks like a smart butler, it has a sim in its head of you and your values. So those are bots, agents, and intelligent agents. And then an agent is... The intersection of all of those things, autonomy, intelligence, and personalization, and an agent has a tremendous ability to empower you, or it can trap you into a filter bubble hell, and it's only feeding you the crap that you care about, and now you don't even see the other stuff. So that's a great dystopia to stay out of, it's called a filter bubble, and the book Filter Bubble by Eli Frisier is the one I recommend if you want to see a beautiful dystopia of how bad the future internet could get. If everybody is filter bubbling into just their own little community, and, and they aren't using their agents to keep them aware of everybody else and what their values are. So, what are the four E's of social progress in my Weevil story? Well, they're more equity, which means a greater social contract for people. There's more benefit to participating in society, and there's a more equitable distribution of wealth and power. That doesn't mean everybody's in a communist society where everybody's earning the same. But there's some great political economy um, studies that have 
uh, have made the case, the best book is Why Nations Fail, by Asimoglu and, and Robinson, made the case that if you have a rich-poor divide that gets too great, it gets very corrupting, and if you have it uh, on the order of uh, the Scandinavian democracies until very recently, where the top pay CEO and the average pay person is on a ratio of something like 30 to 1 difference, that's incentivizing, but it's not corrupting. That's their argument. And they give you all this data from all these different nations of how a nation fails because it gets too, too much uh, in the divide. And in the United States today, if you think it's 30 to 1, you think it's higher. It's over 150 to 1. And some of the top corporations, it's as bad as 600 to 1. Wow. So you want equity, and you want empowerment of the individual. The individual wants to get more empowered, right? The average individual. More personal abilities, wealth, and freedom from injustice is how we're defining it. And you want more empathy, love, understanding, compassion, and ethics. Or ability to identify with the other, the person who has different values from you. Even if you don't agree with them, you, can, you have empathy for them. And then so they make a decision. Fortunately, once you have these agents working with you, they're going to be advising you all the time on what the evidence suggests. And that's a very potentially more protopic world. For the people who listen to that advice and who hook up the intelligence module, there'll be people who will not do that. And there'll be dystopias where your first agents may come from, say, Amazon. And you think Amazon wants to maximize your intelligence and, ma and make sure you're, you know, you're um, saving money, or do they want to maximize the value for Amazon shareholders? Right? Maximize Jeff Bezos. <laughs> there you go. Maximize Jeff Bezos value. Whatever those happen to be. He sold something. Okay. There you go. So, so it's important to think about who's going to control these agents, and that's why open source agents are going to be a critical part of this future, just the same way that open source servers made all the proprietary servers um, put, a, put a ceiling on the amount of money they could charge for their stuff, and the amount of corruption that could exist in the system. Open source agents that you and I are all using, if we want to, the Firefox and the whatever, if don't trust the proprietary players, open source agents that everybody out there is adding to and improving are really going to be a key tool because the, your, your personal SIM, the agents that have the record of all the email you've ever written, that have listened to everything you've ever said, you know, it's an easy, it's a trivial problem, you know, to actually record while you're uh, having conversation now. Use a deep learning net and, and just turn all that into searchable text. Use a small amount of space. And to make sure you record only your own voice, that's also trivial. All that deep learning stuff, that's all been figured out. So just your voice and any of your friends who've been permissioned in get recorded and turned into text, searchable text. And that's called life logging. So life logging phones, they are within the next five years. You're going to see people start to use them. And here's a really creepy thing for you to think about. Computational linguists have shown that if I have two years of everything you've said, in a um, natural language processing uh, map, and you're having a senior moment, and you can't remember that word, your natural language understanding algorithm can predict the word you're going to say next 80% of the time. <laughs> 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 right, not. 80 of the time. One year is not enough. You don't, you don't go through all the things you care about, the average person, you know, oh, you're back two years of data, the map is good enough that you can use this as kind of a cognitive assist for the, you know, the CRS syndrome. You know, can't remember stuff. <laughs> and, and some people are going to turn that feature on, and some people are going to be creeped out by it. And a big aspect of whether they turn that on or not is going to determine whether they trust the software behind it and the ethics and values of the people who created it. And this is why I think the open source version of those are going to, there's going to be a lot of very hardcore users who are going to make sure that those components are highly trustable and they're going to be sharing all kinds of versions on what's GitHub? How many people, how many people uh, use GitHub already? There you go. Largest code base on the planet. 31 million snippets of code. 12 million programs. 
and we're just getting started in programming. So what's the, what's the new thing that's coming? Well, deep learning. And deep learning is basically neural nets that you give a lot of data to, and they develop these hierarchical and associational features, just like the way human brains work. And uh, my Medium folks gives you a, um, an article uh, that compares the way human visual cortex works to these deep learning systems, and the neurons talk to each other in the same way. It's a beautiful article that says, this is not artificial intelligence, this is natural intelligence. Does that make sense? Yes, and there's a good book called The Master Algorithm, which talks about the five camps of machine learning. And this camp is camp one and two. It's called evolutionary computing, and it's called, um, it's called um, connectionism or neural networks. And those, turn, those two turn out to be natural, the way biology does things. And my bets are fully on natural computing getting us to the future. So, Actually, since we're running out of time, I'm just going to jump to, oh, conversational encoders. Once you have a, a, an agent that you can talk to, I'm going to give you a vision that on GitHub today, less than 2% of all of the code out there is deep learning code that is trained, not coded. Once you have these conversational front ends to the deep learning systems, so that you can just talk to your uh, development environment and have it put together these, go to, go to TensorFlow Playground. TensorFlow is an open source um, uh, deep learning tool that Google open sourced three or four months ago to try and stay on the front end of this incredibly fast race. And TensorFlow Playground allows you to actually see these neural nets and actually play with them and see, see what happens at each of the different nodes on the way there. And those tools are going to be put together in a conversational platform using hardware like this NVIDIA hardware, which, by the way, created a car that learned to drive itself in six months. This is so much more radically awesome than the Google car, I can barely even begin to start to tell you. It has, and, and like the Tesla version of this, too, which is an auto assist, it, it works with humans. So it anticipates what humans do. They solved that problem. Google never solved that problem. How did they solve it? Again, through deep learning. Google didn't start in deep learning. They are scrambling now to get to the front of that after these other companies jump to these more natural methods. And it's amazing how fast these systems learn, and they learn like babies. And the really interesting thing is the kids that are coming up today are going to be talking to their computers to build these neural nets. They'll be checking out that code from GitHub. They're going to be training it against all these really interesting data sets in the knowledge graph. And then they're going to be annotating, oh, this was really useful here, and it failed right here. What are we going to do? Let's try a different iteration of that. Uh, let, let, let's fork it into five different versions and see which one might work a little bit better. That's a world where you don't have 12 million coders. You have hundreds of millions of coders. And every person who's speaking to their agent through their smartphone is actually kind of a coder, too, because you're saying to your little agent, no, I actually like Bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> change that. And then it changes its values, preferences to more accurately reflect you, and then you can share all those with anyone else the way you can now start sharing some of your ranking data on the social network. So, three billion new minds coming online. These kids are all going to learn language from birth, the, the primary languages, the dominant languages, <coughs> while they're learning their, their own local languages. So there's this massive convergence on English primarily, and then Chinese, but Chinese is much harder to learn than English, so English is the number one language. People are expecting maybe maybe 300 million new English speakers in the next 25 years, all around the world. And you as an entrepreneur can hire any of these kids and work with them virtually. People who are connected up with these networks are going to feel like they're symbionts, which means a group net, which means they function better as a group. When you go in for an interview, you'll have a You'll have an interview with the group net turned off to find out what you know, like closed book test. And then you'll have a second interview with your group net turned on because your agents and your friends all permissioned in, dropping in to, to help you when you need that help. But 
those few five minutes that you need to learn that technical thing when you're blocked, you're going to be so much more vastly skilled when you're in the group net. And your abilities in the group net are going to depend on the quality of your first person lifelines and the AIs you're attached to. Does that make sense? That's the group net reason. So, yes, we get the singularity eventually. And the first problem we have, which was Naveen's name? Naveen, is that right? Nevin's, Nevin's question, how do we make them safe? Well, let's start with how nature made us safe. Natural computing is what we're going to, these bottom-up systems that you're not coding, but they're learning like babies. How did nature make us as a natural computing safe? 100,000 or 10,000 years ago, when we first started domesticating dogs and cats, could you trust them in a room with small babies? Could you leave the room? No way. They were like dingoes today in Australia. Tunis, they'll grab whatever, no one's around. Now almost every variety of dog and cat that we've domesticated, we can trust. How do we know we can trust it? Did we code it? Did we rationally design it top down? Or did we select for symbiosis and those are the ones we let breed? Hmm. Does that make sense? That's exactly how you're going to trust the robots and the agents of the future. You're going to have a past GitHub check uh, um, blockchain or whatever uh, proof check that this particular agent has worked really well in all these different circumstances, and that's the one you want to have in your personal robot running around the house doing stuff for you. Because guess what? That personal robot is going to do some bad things, just like the Tesla car you know, decapitated the driver just recently because he was dumb enough not to be at the wheel when the, when the semi went around. He was reading or crotch gazing or texting or whatever he was doing. And, and the car that was in front of him, the, the semi that went in front of him, had a white side, and it was a bright day, bright sunny day. And the AI didn't see it, and he didn't see it. And those kind of problems are going to continue to happen in our, in our AIs as they get smarter. But is the number of people going to be killed by these agents going to be lower than humans driving cars? It's going to be probably orders of magnitude. So we're going to allow it, and our lawyers are going to figure out who, who pays, right? And that's a fascinating world. How do you make a system safe? You select for safety. But there's more. There's two books I didn't pass around. These are my two best books on the future of making complex systems safe. The first is called Natural Security, and the second is called Learning from the Octopus. I'll pass around a different one on each. On each uh, please, please uh, keep, give them back again. Yeah. <laughs> I have notes in some of these. How does biology create? What's the second most complex system in the human brain after neural nets, which is what deep learning systems copy? The second most complex system in the human in a human organism and all living organisms after the brain is the immune system. Vastly complicated system. So these guys got together and said, how does nature create immune systems? And how do we add those security, that, that kind of security to our AIs and to all of our physical security systems? And they wrote these two beautiful books, and they call it natural security as opposed to artificial security, which we have today, just top-down, brittle stuff, right? And they said, mostly you have to have a lot of transparency from the bottom. Your immune system surveils everything in your body. It knows what's self and what's non-self. You use a system called a thymus that massively trained you over the first uh, five years of your life. And then it starts shrinking because you have these, um, these B cells distributed throughout your entire body and these dendritic cells, which present anything that might be non-self to the, to the system. And then it decides if it's non-self, is it safe or not? And if it's safe, it decides if it's safe if you are, if you're eating it. It's called oval tolerance. That's why anything that you are, um, you have an allergy to, you can eat small bits of it and train the allergy away. Any good allergen knows that, right? So we do peanut allergies, including anaphylactic shock peanut allergies. You can train all that stuff away with your immune system. That's how smart it is. You just have to continue to train it. Like train it. So surveillance is mostly how immune systems work. And there's a little bit of surveillance from the top down. Are most of the cameras going on in the world today and most of the AIs that we're going to see in the future going to be bottom up or top down? What do you think? Bottom up. Bottom up. Vastly more bottom up. Just like 95% of the cameras in uh, you know, Manhattan today are bottom up. They're either CCTV cams in private ownership or they're cell phone cams. 
that's the future of AIs too. And there's a little bit of top down that tries to control the system, but the reality is most of the change happens from the bottom up. The more connected the system gets, the more integrated it gets, the more it gets like a single organism. That's another way that immune systems create safety. Also, they select for symbiosis. Remember that we just described with the, with the animals? They select for systems that are proven past behavior good. Another thing immune systems do is they pre-visualize, they simulate everything. That's what the B cells do in the first 10 years of your life when you're growing up. And they have incredible redundancy. You have incredible redundancy throughout your body, particularly in your brain, so that if one area gets hacked, you restore the information you care about in multiple locations. That's why immune system, that's why neural networks are so incredibly um, uh, stable compared to other forms of computing. You can have a single bit out of place in a today's config file and in an artificially intelligent machine, and you crash the whole system. If you have a single neural connection that's disrupted in a brain, do you know what it does? It reroutes around the damage. I can't remember her name. Oh, let me think of some other aspect of her. Oh yeah, well, yeah, she went here, she went to that college, and oh yeah, Angeline. You actually recreated the, the, the engram, which is the memory, by routing around the damage. The other amazing thing that neural nets do is they, they switch a thousand times a second, and they can search the entire brain in a few uh, seconds and know whether information is novel or something you've heard before or they've partly heard before. Conventional computers can't do that. And the third thing that makes neural nets incredible is in the hyperparameter space of all the possible variables that might be ad adaptive or important to your, to your um, uh, current situation, the neural nets are constantly weighting them all against each other. And they fan out into a possibility space, and then they fan back in, and, and the neural nets that connect up the strongest, and create the largest synapse, they reduce the hyperparameter space into just those few neurons, or just those few parameters that are most useful. Conventional computers can't do that. It's such a vastly more stable way of learning how systems work <clears throat> that, to me, it's completely obvious that that's the future of computing. If you need a system that can manage all that complexity in a very uh, adaptive way. So there's several other books here on the kinds of things that immune systems do, and I think now would be a good time to probably end on one last, one last slide. We can incredibilize ourselves or we can qualify ourselves as we go forward. Does that make sense? Your yeah. agents are going to get smarter. Your agent's going to be like a little baby. It's going to be the fastest growing piece of you. You're going to think of it like a little baby that you're training up. Wow, that's so awesome, that digital me. And you're going to feel like it's a natural extension of you. And it's going to anticipate stuff more and more. But you, as a biological organism, you can use that incredible power in two ways. You can lean back or lean forward. Leaning forward, you incredibleize yourself. And you use your agent to measure you, to make you a better critical thinker, uh, better able to uh, politically act, lobby for the things you care about. Have you heard of basic income? What's basic income? That's right. Three countries have all have all run it up the flagpole already. Um, I think it's one of those inevitable futures. Why is it inevitable? Because there's so much wealth being created on the top, and because technological unemployment just keeps going up, up and up. It's easier and easier for machines to throw people out of work. So you have to have uh, more money spent on welfare uh, and training, and more, uh, more money spent on education, and more money spent on social safety nets. But the coolest social safety net of all, all is the idea of the basic income. When a society becomes wealthy enough, everybody just votes for a minimum of thirty or forty thousand dollars that every citizen gets. And who are they taxing? Are they taxing the corporations? No. Are they taxing the rich people? No. Who are you taxing when you create a basic income? You're taxing the future. You're taxing the machines. And that idea actually came from Faraday. That's how old that idea is, one of the inventors of electricity. You're taxing the machines. They talked about that idea back in the 1800s. Can you believe that? So what does that mean? It means, I imagine, yes, you could, all kinds of tax structures could create, pay for a basic income. But the most obvious one, possibly the fairest, is anybody using advanced automation, they pay a little bit more in, in corporate taxes. And that pays for the basic income of everybody else. And then they can focus on the things that they care about. So basic income, in my opinion, is one of those inevitables. And how do you get it? 
How do you get a basic income? Does the vote go away in an agent enabled future? One person, one vote? Maybe in a few societies, corporations are going to get votes based on that money. In every society, yeah, they are. In every society where people with more money don't get more votes, that was actually defeated when the founding fathers talked about it. So in every democracy where people still have one person, one vote, and they have an agent, I would argue it's pretty obvious that a basic income happens. The, uh, Switzerland just defeated the basic income referendum. All of the 20-somethings voted for it 80%. So the future, from their perspective, is, heck yeah, get me out of a job I don't necessarily like. I want some freedom. And it's been tried two different times uh, in, in educated societies, and people didn't just put their feet up and do nothing. They went back to work, or they started businesses. And you can incentivize people to do that. So you can do basic income well or poorly. And poorly would be, I would say, Saudi Arabia, where you have a dependency economy, you just give everything away, and don't, people have no incentive to do anything. So there's two ways to do a basic income, but uh, there's several ways, but uh, if we already have examples, like in Canada and Namibia, where basic income actually incentivized people um, developing themselves, uh, incredibilizing themselves. So we end on that. Thank you, and we have time for a Q&A.